I've had instructions to start a session, and I'd like to do that by introducing the next speaker, who for me, in the 90s in particular, was sort of a myth. And Helga Novotny was at that time already in the corridors of the European Union, sort of the champion of higher education. And she was responsible for a lot of the action. <clears throat> and she particularly defended the humanities and the social sciences with whom I felt close and who were at that point in the research directorate really completely overwhelmed by the natural scientists. And so last night when we finally found a time to talk, which we've never done before, I found out also a little bit about the battle to create the European Research Council, which allowed for the first time research to actually be judged and awarded money on its own and for its own criteria. Because you have to remember that in those days, in the 90s, the actual research directorate of the European Union was piloted by industry. There was an industrial council that directed the directorate to follow particular kinds of things. So with that, yesterday I heard a little bit about the battles that went on <laughs> before the ERC was actually created. And with great thanks for that <laughs> to you, I'd like to introduce you to give Thank your you. talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sander. You know, sometimes the past comes and haunts me, but I think those of you who know the European Research Council, I can really say it has been a success. No, no. And we are very glad that we have it in yeah. Europe. I also want to thank Jan. Um, I participated in Singapore in a couple of the Paralimis conferences. And I'm very happy that we can bring a bit of the Paralimis atmosphere and the uh, Paralimis spirit also now here to Stockholm and hopefully to other places in, in Europe. Um, I used this, this is the title of my book, but as the book appeared already in 2021, my thoughts have moved on, but I wanted to show it to you because it contains the words illusion and control. So th this has been on my, on my thoughts. The title in A We Trust uh, has to be taken with a grain of salt, of course. And uh, the title I give now to my talk is really uh, a slightly different one. It's the illusion of control or not being in control. I will illustrate it by talking about technology and in particular about the latest uh, generative AI that uh, were already introduced. Mm -hmm. I have a motto here. I have a motto. And uh, as you heard from my very first intervention here, this is um, very close to my heart because I think that uh, this is when modern science came about, this was uh, written into its birth certificate because modern science had to struggle with the illusion of control and had to devise ways of thinking, ways of doing experiments in order not to be taken by the illusion, the senses that were very important. You look at something, but what do you actually see? You measure something with instruments that you know are faulty, that cannot be <clears throat> uh, compared, etc. And this is something that has remained with science ever since. We speak about objective science, but very few people realize that the objectivity of science has a fascinating history. This is not something you know, that was there from day one, as I, as I just said. Rather, it had to be uh, negotiated, it had to be reestablished again and again. And finally, in the middle of the 19th century, <clears throat> with the rise of modern science as, and its great impact, <clears throat> this was the first time when technology and science teamed up together. Technology has existed since ancient times everywhere. 
Science has existed in some parts of the world in different forms, but it was only in the middle of the 19th century that the two came together, the technology became science-based, which meant it could accelerate and it could do more mm -hmm. because it was science-based. And at that time, objectivity was defined as mechanical objectivity. You had measurements, you knew what you were measuring, you had the standard meter in Paris, and you had many other instruments that continuously had to be calibrated. And <clears throat> this has not gone away, we still rely on it. But now science and the ways of doing science has moved on. We have simulation models, and now we are using AI as part of the way of doing science. And you have probably heard about AlphaFold and you know, the first time that an AI was able uh, even to trump what uh, thousands of volunteers had been able to do, which was already better than <clears throat> what scientists had done in the lab, namely to um, come up with the protein folding. And now we know uh, the machine can do it much better. And the machine will do other things better. Nevertheless, science is what we have learned about how to keep from fooling ourselves. And this pertains to the latest technology as much as to everything else. So to get um, started, the illusion of control, and of course we want to control the, the illusion. But if this is already as uh, Richard Feynman's um, uh, sentence indicates, this is already difficult for scientists and it remains for scientists and, and engineers, let alone for all those uh, others. And there are many, many others. Mm -hmm. um, we heard <clears throat> the, the credulous and, and the gullible. And at times we all remember we have been taken in by things that we thought were true, but then at closer look, we thought, um, you know, we, we started to believe what we wanted to believe, a very human tendency. But then there are those that are overconfident <clears throat> and empirical studies um, have shown the overconfident are overrepresented among policymakers, among politicians, and as we heard yesterday um, from Nick, also among managers. And there are partly um, personality reasons, partly these are individual predispositions, but as always with individual predispositions, this is reinforced by the social and cultural circumstances. So if you are recruited, selected, appointed, to be the head of a corporation, you have already a pre-selection that is looking for certain traits. And I would say overconfidence does not hurt you if you are striving to get into such a position. And the same is true <clears throat> for people who are socialized in environments, you know, that instills overconfidence um, in them. And switching from individuals um, to individuals as head of large um, social groups, if we look <coughs> at wars, this is the extreme case of overconfidence because you find it on both sides. And we know that wars do not have a chance <coughs> to end before one side starts to realize maybe our confidence will not work out the way we had thought it would work out. And also as usual, both sides think they have technology on their side. They do have technology on their side. This is the history of human wars. But nevertheless, this, are, uh, this is one of the arenas, human tragic arenas, where overconfidence is paid by the lives of millions and millions of people. And then there is the rest of us. So illusion <clears throat> has a blind spot. And the blind spot only comes to the fore when it clashes with reality. Because as long as we are caught in an illusion, mm -hmm. we are not aware. 
we are deluding ourselves and we continue to delete to delude ourselves as long as reality does not catch up with us part of this reality is nature and uh, even now in you know this high uh, high technical scientific civilization we are still faced with the forces of nature that we thought we might be able to control and we realize we are not in control of. But then, of course, <clears throat> the uh, illusions have also to be accepted by others around ourselves. There are others that confirm our illusion or that puncture our illusion. And so we need <clears throat> to, um, in, in, in order to, um, <clears throat> move uh, in, into this conceptual area, and I call it a tricky concept because um, it overlaps with other concepts. You heard beautiful uh, definitions that were given by, by Sander on the first day. We saw other definitions, etc. For me, it is a, it, it's a tricky concept because it's difficult to um, uh, distinguish it from neighboring concepts. And, you know, a fake is something that can take us in. It can catch us in an illusion, yet it's not genuine. We, we know it's not genuine or we find out that it's not genuine. Fiction is part of our imagination. We could not live a life without fiction. And there is a political scientist, uh, Yaron Azrahi from, uh, from Israel, who wrote a book about the necessity of fiction in democracy. And he says democracy, like any other political regime, is a necessary fiction. And what he means by that is that a political regime has certain ideas about what it is and what it wants to be. And then there is the reality. And this gap is necessary in order to maintain the fiction that you can somehow reach and strive towards the idea. And without this, you end in cynicism or in chaos. So there are arguments where you can say, well, you know, sometimes we need the necessity of fiction, but at the same time, you know it is a fiction and yet you <clears throat> keep to it because you think it's an ideal and we don't want uh, to give it up, we have to strive uh, towards it. Then, of course, um, this is what uh, the, the type of uh, situation we, we face today, and this has been uh, talked about in yesterday and, and today. Um, if uh, we define illusion, as I would do, very simply, it's out of sync with reality. It reality can be a natural reality, it can be a social reality, it can be a mixture between natural and social reality, because you cannot simply separate them. The one supports the other. Uh, then uh, what I see uh, at risk is our socially um, shared frame of reference. And this is being eroded by things like, um, you know, uh, Google truths, alternative facts, you have all kinds of erosion processes that are undermining what we think and what we need as a socially uh, shared frame of reference. Science is not truth with a big T, capital T. Science is an approximation of truth, whatever we understand by truth. And it is this... <clears throat> idea of you can reach truths even if you do not have truths, but you can strive towards truths, you approximate it, is also an important idea in democracy. So there's a regulative idea of truths that underpins democracies. Because if you do away with that, you can no longer say what is true, what is false, and you end up in uh, excusing experts uh, and scientists. This is just your opinion. Nobody cares about it because you have no right to tell me anything. You tell us that vaccination is good. I don't believe one word of it. Um, 
who are you to uh, wanting to tell me anything to, to begin with? So, and this is this erosion also of the legitimating idea of truth that a democracy needs. Now, <clears throat> uh, it is a, tri a tricky concept also um, because we are not sure, and we discussed this in the session before, you know, who, who are we and you know, who is in control over what, where is the locus of control. It's, it's very distributed, it's very difficult to, to get a, a grip on that. But as we speak about technology, there it's very clear. Control mm -hmm. is inherent to technology. We build a technology in order to control the function for which we build it. And the criteria is very clear. It works or it does not work. And if it works, we are in control of the technology. And of course, it's an inbuilt uh, function, so you have to know what you want to uh, attain. You have to know the, the means. But um, technology is also something that needs to be maintained over time. It needs repairs. It needs an infrastructure. It is embedded in a larger kind of environment, etc. All this needs also to be controlled. So the control is not just the single device where we can say we have done this now and now you know we have a proof of concept we have a demonstration uh, object and now we are happy it works you have to go beyond it and you have to make sure that, that the control expands first of all to maintain it you know material erodes you have all kinds of infrastructure that collapses after a time uh, if it is not properly maintained, etc. So you have to extend control. You have extend a control of technology also um, to those who work with. These were the big fights uh, during the period of industrialization. The workers who had to serve and work with the machine had to be protected. It was a question of safety of the machine. And being controlled, being in control of the machine implied to be in control so that the workers working with the machine are also <clears throat> protected. This took a long time. You know, we had the, the, the labor movement, we had organized um, unions after after a while. And um, by now it is accepted, at least in some parts of the world, unfortunately not in all parts of the world and unfortunately not for all workers. But nevertheless, uh, it is clear control of technology implies control of the conditions under which people work with it, their health, their safety. And then we continue to expand it. Now we are expecting from technology that it also protects us against other kinds of harms. You have environmental legislation everywhere. You have environmental regulation. What is the impact, not just on people, their health, also on the environment and so on. And so we have built up, at least in some parts of the world, <laughs> a kind of safety culture that um, <clears throat> where the idea of control of uh, technology is being continued to expand over foreseeable consequences, but if possible also uh, on unforeseeable, unanticipated consequences. So we have this, this drive. And the, um, this extension of control now also reaches the latest technology, <clears throat> artificial intelligence. And here the impact, there's an environmental impact because we know it needs far too much energy now, um, et cetera. But above all, we realize it has a cognitive impact on people. It has an emotional impact. And therefore, we have to expand the notion of control 
uh, of this new technology to include also the emotional impact and the cognitive impact. And that's the problem we face. This is an issue of control. And with, on, with control comes the question of agency, who is in control. And in my view, um, and everyone who you know, is uh, confronted with the term intelligence realizes that today nobody would call the thing artificial intelligence anymore. You know, we have no, no, no idea, no consensus what human mm -hmm. intelligence is, let alone what machine intelligence is. And it's also not about intelligence. It's mm -hmm. about agency. Who has agency? And intelligence will be expanded. I'm quite sure of that because um, we have already expanded the notion of intelligence to the intelligence of animals. Uh, the simple way to survive is needs a form of intelligence. So, you know, we will speak about different forms of intelligence, and hopefully this will make it easier for people to understand when we call a machine intelligent, it has not nothing, it has something to do because there are similarities, obviously, but there are also similarities with the intelligence of animals. But the crucial point is agency. So let me, <clears throat> very quickly, I will not uh, delve into that, uh, but the, <clears throat> the idea behind the extending this uh, control and having the obligation to think about how can we control this new technology, of course, um, is in, in, in line of this, um, you know, expectation you are, we are expected to manage th this new technology just as we have managed other technologies before. We have a host of regulation, be it air traffic, be it um, you know how to keep medicine uh, for children out of reach to nuclear power plants. We have certifications, we have uh, checklists, we have protective gear, we have a host of certifications, etc. And with AI, we are at the beginning of something that looks like regulation. And we are just beginning to discuss what could this be? How could we set it up? Now, <clears throat> this um, also should alert us to the fact, why is there resistance to this kind of regulation? Because control is a double phase. Control can protect you because if you are in control of technology, if you are in control that it will not harm you, that there will be um, <clears throat> uh, harm avoided, prevention of accidents, prevention of errors, which is important for everyone working in science and engineering. You have to prevent errors to, uh, to occur, <laughs> etc. So all this has a protective preventive function. But the other side of control, of course, it gives you power. And especially when it comes to humans who hold the power and who are not being held responsible, this becomes problematic. So here we have it now, generative AI, you know, you know what it is, you know how it functions, large language uh, models that have been in the making for some time. Um, all of a sudden, you know, it burst to the to the force. The good thing about the enormous visibility and public publicity that uh, GPT got from day one, of course, is that everyone in society now knows something is happening. People uh, can try it out. It's visible. It's not something abstract uh, like the metaverse, uh, etc. So people can talk about it. And I would say public discussion about it is necessary. And it's good that we have public uh, discussion. Now, this particular um, uh, technology, which may well become what um, economists of innovation call a general purpose technology, you know, that is being used in all applications and domains, like electricity is one example of a general purpose technology, that it may become something like this, 
So it will be all over. And the way it has been designed is to make us believe we communicate with you. This was not a necessity. It could have been designed in other ways, but it was deliberately designed in this way, partly <clears throat> to take us in, to lure us in, to make us believe that we talk with a, with a human, and part of its success um, is that it meets with our deeply inbred anthropomorphic <laughs> tendency. And we all know this from everyday use. We have an anthropomorphic language with things. We call something it or he or she or whatever your native language <clears throat> is, although we know it's a thing, it's not a person. And Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, has written a whole book about this called The Instantial Stance uh, to, to show how deeply inbred this is, including in our language, but also in our perception, in our cognition, that we treat things as though they were persons, although we know they are not persons. You damn bloody computer, why don't you work? Um, and it's harmless if it does not go beyond that. We have been become accustomed to it, it's harmless. But now when it comes to chat GPT or GPT-4 or BART or Bing, or, you know, there are in the meantime, uh, several dozens of them <clears throat> uh, and, and more will come out there. This becomes <laughs> um, a slightly different uh, matter because there is the ambiguity due to our anthropomorphic tendency. Am I really speaking to a machine? I think I know, but the machine responds in a way that makes me feel as if I'm speaking to a human. I feel some kind of empathy, even if I know a machine does not have empathy. But nevertheless, it behaves in such a way that I feel it listens to me. You know, my mother does not listen to me, says the teenager, but you know, the AI listens to me, and this is why I speak with the AI. And so we are drawn into this, and um, it's also um, a certain ambiguity that enters here because it blurs the line between you and the other. Is the other, I call them digital others, you know, is the other a machine, a digital other, or perhaps it's human-like, living or not living, and, and so on. And I sometimes wonder uh, that, um, you know, we are prone to, um, we have all these problems when you listen to your kids or if you read uh, the literature about the young generation today. Why do they have so many problems with their identity? Mm -hmm. And the uh, Nobel Prize winner uh, in literature, Ali Erno, uh, last year's Nobel Prize here in Stockholm for literature, she wrote a book about her life in, in France, uh, you know, way back in, in, in the 70s. And there she has a paragraph and she says, she speaks about identity. And she says, you know, in the days back then, you know what identity was? Identity was a piece of paper, a carton where you had a photograph printed on it and you had to use it if you wanted to go to the cinema and show that you were already above 16. So you had an identity card in many European countries, but that was it. You carried it in your pocket, in your wallet. And now everyone speaks about identity. No one knows quite what it is. And I think it may not be a coincidence that many young people are in such an intimate communication with a machine that they start to become confused about their identity. And they have this wish, especially during puberty, you know, to find themselves, to assert themselves. Who am I? What is my identity? And this is another you know, uh, thing that we have to uh, consider. This is just um, generative AI surrounded by hype and strong beliefs. 
this famous paper by uh, people who were working on GPT-4 that claimed that they saw sparks of general artificial intelligence, the state of AI when it will be um, as intelligent or at human level taking over cognitive um, abilities. And even this uh, famous or infamous letter uh, for a memorandum, you know, uh, look, at, look at the word, you know, ever more powerful digital minds. It uses the word minds that no one, no one, it's impossible, no one, not even the creators, you know, the creator, the word create, uh, can understand, predict, or rely on. So it's sort of seeding uh, in, in, in a letter calling for memorandum. There is no need to speak about this here. The letter for memorandum. Yeah? And you speak about the minds and, and so on. So it's about agency, not about uh, intelligence. And what we do in our interaction with AI is to transfer part of our agency to the machine. The machine, and this is another long discussion I will not enter here, whether they are living beings or non-living beings. Uh, Edward Lee has written a whole book about it. He thinks we can speak about living digital entities and others say, no, uh, life is very different, apart from the fact that no one can define, we have no consensus on what life is. But, anyway. but it does <clears throat> lead to this blurring of boundaries, categories, hybrid forms of interaction uh, that I just spoke about it. And so we are lured into it. We are made believe, we become addicted. And we know that the way how the large corporations that are the ones <clears throat> who are in power and that control to some extent, because they were the ones who said we wanted to design in a way that it communicates um, with the users um, to, um, to create uh, intentionally this illusion that uh, we talk with a human. And this is an illusion and it, became, it can become addictive as we know. And one of the characteristics of every addict is an addict is in the illusion that he or she can quit at will. That's the definition of addiction. And you cannot, because uh, your brain works in a different way and it takes much more than a sheer power of will to get off an addiction. Now, <clears throat> this. let's take a, a quick look um, <clears throat> at um, what is attribution of agency to algorithm consists of and what it does. And this I have written at greater length in, in, in my book about, but nevertheless, I want to mention it here. First of all, <clears throat> um, I think what is um, very, um, let us say, enticing, uh, luring, uh, exciting, but at the same time risky, is um, the predictive algorithms. Predictive algorithms uh, are great in the sense that they allow us to see further into the future. Uh, prediction is a mark of science. Science wants to predict, but science has to be very careful under which conditions, uh, and it wants to test its predictions. And there are very uh, <clears throat> precise conditions under which you can say, yes, I've tested my predictions and um, this holds or it does not hold, or under these conditions it holds and not under, under. So there's a great power in prediction and it also drives science forward. On the other hand, uh, the wish to know the future is as old as humanity. And practically in every civilization, in every social group that we have any traces left of today, we know they practiced divination. And they used whatever you know, natural material was around. In China, <clears throat> this has uh, are the oracle bones. 
which were only discovered uh, in the late 19th century. And these were the blades of sheep or sometimes turtles <laughs> that were held over the fire and then cracks appeared in the blades. And you had special practitioners, diviners, <clears throat> experts, who had to interpret and predict to the local king, to the ones in power, the policy makers that we heard before, uh, what the future holds in store. These people needed technical skills, but they also needed social skills, because if the crack according to the expert said something that was not so positive, you know, how to wrap it up in a way that uh, you could still, you know, sell it to the, to, to the king. So it was an art, but technical skills and social skills had to come together. And in a way, we still do this today. We have forecasts, uh, what happens in 2030, 2040, 2050, you have uh, Deloitte, McKinsey, you name it, you know. It's all over the place, wanting to tell those in power what the future holds. And they have to wrap it in a very clever way. So there's some continuity in, in our lives. And we still, as human beings, we want to know what the future holds. Partly, of course, um, because we are curious but partly, of course, because we want to prevent bad things to happen. And so what happens now with these uh, predictive algorithms is they make our lives seemingly easier. And some of it is banal. You know, the prediction um, that um, <clears throat> the large corporation gets from your data, which it has been harvesting and collecting in grant uh, quantities, it's easy to say, um, because we are creatures of habit, what kind of book you want to buy next, or which vacation location you choose, um, <clears throat> what is your preference in with regard to games you want to play, movies you want to see, you name it, you know it. It's all there and it's relatively easy to extrapolate from the past and to predict your future habits, your pr future preferences. But then it also becomes a bit more subtle if it's about uh, moods, emotions, and we know uh, now we also collect data or data are collected about moods. People wear fitness bands. So, um, you know, the data are there. How do you feel in the morning? Uh, how do you feel in the evening? How do you feel after having been drinking this or perhaps smoking that? And so on, talking with your wife or... So you get all this data together that are able to predict how, how you will behave in the future. And this leads some people to say a phrase, and I've heard it several times, and it always makes me shudder a bit. The AI knows me better than I know myself. And if you think of it, you know, this, what does it say about the power of AI? It says very much. If you believe that the AI knows you better than yourself. And so one of the risks I see here is that of self-fulfilling prophecy. If uh, users forget these are data, it's based on data of the past, the AI does not know the future. Nobody knows the future. And the AI does not know it either. Whatever the AI tells you, perhaps about a medical condition, it's only couched in probabilities. And while it's harmless, if you want to have uh, coffee tomorrow instead of tea, uh, it's nevertheless good to remind ourselves that whatever predictions we get, it's couched in probabilities. But evolution has not equipped us very well to deal with probabilities, so we have some difficulties. In, but we, we can learn. We can learn, and there are ways of presenting probabilities. And I think this is one of the messages we have to get out to the larger public, uh, that whatever AI tells you it is couched in probabilities. There is no absolute certainty. 
And <clears throat> a self-fulfilling prophecies would mean, in the fact, those who don't know the term, it was invented by an American sociologist way back in the 1930s, the years of the depression in, in, in America. And um, what happened was that people started uh, to hear maybe there will be a bank crash. So everyone rushed to get their deposits from the bank. And lo and behold, <clears throat> the bank, of course, had to close. And <clears throat> that was the end. And this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. People start to believe a situation as being real. And it becomes real by the consequences because people act accordingly. And that's the self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. Other <clears throat> predictive algorithms um, <clears throat> have to do with this decision-making. And here we have heard a lot about, uh, not in this room, but we know about the, the very real risk of discriminating. Um, we all have biases, but the data have societal biases accumulated. So there is the risk of discrimination against groups in society that are already discriminated against. This is reinforced. <coughs> and also <coughs> one difference is with the AI, there is no recourse foreseen. I had a panel discussion the other day in Vienna at the Technical University, and we spoke about ChatGPT. And there was a lady, a woman professor who retired. She was a professor of informatics. And she said, um, you know, I was playing with ChatGPT, Chat, and, and I was asking about myself. And uh, the machine said, you have died in 2021. So. First, she was taken aback, and then she said, how do you know? And ChatGPT said, well, according to renounced resources from several uh, universities in Europe, um, <clears throat> this is the source of my knowledge. And then she said, you know, I'm Professor Christine Floyd, and I'm still alive. So ChatGPT said, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> But she was upset because, you know, if this is Wikipedia, she knows I can write and ask someone to correct it. <clears throat> then we had an interesting discussion with two experts. <clears throat> and we wanted to know from the experts, can you correct this? And they said, we don't know, but it's unlikely. So this is what we <clears throat> are in for decision making. And then, of course, uh, communication. And uh, <clears throat> I <clears throat> just want to say here, uh, what many of us in Europe don't realize is um, this algorithmic uh, intimacy. Uh, Anthony Elliott has written a book about this. How many so-called therapeutic AIs are in use in the United States? for people who cannot afford a proper psychiatrist or a proper uh, therapist, they have recourse to a cheaper machine and they speak with the AI about their problems. The machines are programmed to give them, you know, to make them upbeat. And in some instances, this may be fine, but if you have a serious condition, this will be exactly the opposite of what a human therapist would be. This is completely unregulated. You can do with it what you want. And now in Belgium, there was the first suicide, not with this um, generation, with a previous generation. And um, the man had spoken with the machine for six weeks and then the, uh, from the from the protocol, we see that he asked the machine, should I kill myself? And the machine sort of gave its blessing and he killed himself. So let me let me move on to uh, <clears throat> some <clears throat> some um, <clears throat> uh, larger picture. <clears throat> because uh, very often, you know, we are fascinated and we focus just on the latest technology. We are overwhelmed by awe. But I would say sometimes it's um, quite uh, healthy and some um, mentally good to uh, go back in history 
and to say, you know, it started a long time ago, the cultural evolution that, you know, uh, <clears throat> I, I asked about uh, uh, to, to, um, <clears throat> to Dan, <laughs> you know, the cultural evolution, it started, um, one big step was the transition from an oral culture to writing. And what writing did, as Plato lamented, you know, it will decrease our ability to memorize. But on the other hand, it had an enormous cultural impact because for the first time, people were confronted not only with what happened in the past that was in their selective memory, but with what was written down at that particular point in time. And so they had to come to different terms with the past. Next big transition, and uh, <clears throat> I will not go into details here, is of course the printing press and this beautiful book by Elizabeth Eisenstadt, uh, Eisenstein, uh, the printing press as an agent of change. And as we know, the printing press made it possible for many people to learn to read and to write because there was a big incentive. You wanted to have access to this new uh, technology. And you could form judgments on your own. You were no longer dependent on what the local uh, parish priest told you or what your teacher told you. You had access to books. You had access to other kinds of knowledge. And it fermented, uh, had a big impact also for the scientific revolution for modern science. Because all, all of a sudden, you could compare illustrations of plants that were so important. And instead of having these distortions of copying and copying, you could see much more precisely which kinds of plants uh, were pictured and so on. So it had um, an enormous impact as an agent of change on the Reformation, so on theological um, thought, mm -hmm. also, of course, on the history of of, of uh, Europe, if you think of the Westphalian uh, peace treaty, which was part of an outcome of the wars between Protestants and, and Catholics, um, <clears throat> uh, but also on the European Enlightenment and so on. Then we moved on to the age of mass communication, again, an externalization. Crossing enormous distances, the telegraph, the telephone distances shrunk the world became smaller, more and more. But also it made possible mass communication, both in the sense of one to many, and then later with personalizing, uh, targeting, um, having content created, um, <clears throat> messages as we now do with blogs and so on, until we come to generative AI. So far, the latest step in externalizing some of our faculties, namely now they produce answers. They produce things. We tell them, do this, do that, and they do it. So we are externalizing um, upon uh, prompting. So this is, this is the, the larger picture. Now, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the illusion of control and the fear of losing control becomes more acute the more the world is of our own making. It started with technology and the extension of control of technology and sometimes the hubris that went with it. Modernity was the, also the age of hubris, of <clears throat> uh, having everything under, under control. But at the same time, <clears throat> there is also a very deep-seated fear of losing control. And there's a whole uh, series of literature on technological pessimism in European romanticism and, and so on, the fear that uh, technology takes over life becomes impersonal, the system, whatever the system is, you know, takes control. We are losing our personal relations. We are losing our relationship to nature, et cetera. This is a very old uh, topic that 
you know, is an illustration in literature and, and in paintings and in art, uh, where this fear of losing control, which is very much tied to the Western value of an individual and individual autonomy um, uh, is, is coming to the fore. But then <clears throat> speaking about, um, <clears throat> you know, control and how can we keep under control if we make more and more a world of our making? The task expands and expands. And here, <clears throat> Giambattista Vico, <clears throat> uh, a great Renaissance uh, person, he wrote this Fienza Nuova, for which he's most famous, but also before, he spoke about <clears throat> something, <clears throat> it's an old paragraph, but uh, the essence is now called Verum Factum, the <coughs> Latin words for it. What, it, what he wrote was what men, he spoke about men, make, <clears throat> they may know truly only what they make and what God knows only God knows. And <clears throat> the, what he meant is we can only know what we make ourselves. And this was part of the humanism of the, rem of the Renaissance. Uh, the idea you make something humans, God <clears throat> makes his own things, we don't know anything about it. Practically, we don't care so much about it. You know, in those days, uh, if you did not want the Vatican to put your book on the index, you had to put in such a phrase. But what he really was concerned about, you know, now we humans make things and we understand what we make. And what we don't make, we don't understand. And this <clears throat> is uh, still true. You know, we that what we make, we understand. But as we make more and more, we enter a world that is of our making, but no longer really of our making, because it is too much, too complex. And how do we deal with it? And at this point, <clears throat> I <clears throat> came across the book by Marshall Salins a great anthropologist who died, uh, I think, last year. Yeah. So the book is a posthumous um, uh, work. It summarizes, uh, he has collected anthropological material uh, as, as far as any person, you know, in the, <clears throat> the 20th century can collect material. And he gives the book the title, The New Science of the Enchanted Universe, <clears throat> an anthropology of most of humanity. And he's certainly right, the most of humanity, because he's speaking mm -hmm. about most of humanity. And most of humanity, our ancestors, live in a world, and he describes it in great detail. It was one cosmic order with other beings. He calls them meta persons, he describes them, and these could be ghosts of plants uh, or animals. These could be gods in various forms or changing forms. This could be forces of nature that you would anthropomorphize in your imagination, etc. And these were not natural forces, but these were meta persons with whom our ancestors were living. And um, <clears throat> he calls this um, <clears throat> a one cosmic order. There was nothing else. And whatever people did was um, done with the help or through these forces. So if you're building a canoe, you had to invoke the spirit of the canoe builders or the spirit of the wood you were treating to make your canoe. And you had to perform certain rituals, and it was only through the force that was transferred <laughs> to you where you were able to build your canoe. If you had political ambitions and you wanted to become the chief of the village, again, you had to know to whom to go to perform which kind of rituals so that you would gain the kind of influence over your tribes people that you, that you were looking for. If you were <clears throat> cultivating a garden, 
again, you know which goddess you had to approach and the goddess had to give you your blessing. And these uh, major persons, they were like humans. They could be very mean. They were fighting amongst each other. They had a hierarchy and the hierarchies were toppled. So it was much like human societies, but they had power over humans and this power was due to one criterion. Humans were mortal and these beings were immortal. And when I reach today and hear about transhumanism, this sounds to me, you know, like a flight of fancy trying to escape the destiny of us, death, and trying to overcome it, much like, you know, these ancestors of ours did in their time. So I come now <clears throat> to my last speculative thoughts. I'm not arguing that we are re-entering a newly enchanted world. You know, Max Weber told us modernity has <clears throat> um, <clears throat> done away, disenchanted the world. Um, but nevertheless, there are some uncanny reflections I have. If more and more of our world is human made, you know, all the satellites, the sensors in my book, I have a whole chapter on the mirror world, um, <clears throat> the data that we are collecting, the simulations we do, complexity <clears throat> science, what it does with it, all this, you know, becomes our human made mirror world. But at the same time, um, we no longer know what we make. We don't understand. We have the black box algorithms. We grapple to make it somewhat interpretable because the European regulator thinks we need to be able to explain something that everyone can understand. But you know, this is on the surface. Um, <clears throat> some people speak about emergence with the chat GPT. We don't even know whether it is emergence or just our ignorance. So we can call it emergence, but is it really emergence or is it just we don't know and don't, don't understand this yet? So <clears throat> uh, all this, um, you know, leads us to, um, to have some kind of uncanny resemblance to the world that most of humanity lived in. Now, there's, of course, one big difference. And that is this world of our ancestors came to an end. It lives on still in parts of our society, you know, like uh, with genes, we have old genes. So we have also old memories of what our ancestors lived through mentally. I, I think this is part of our cultural heritage and our, our human heritage. But the, something happened around the year 3000 before Christ, there is a lot of literature on it, very contested. Was it the time, was it 2500? Did it occur only in you know, Mesopotamia and, and this part of the world? Did it uh, occur in other parts of the world? But something happened then. Um, <clears throat> Peter Turkin, uh, and he has this huge database, Sheshat it's called, um, about the rise of complexity in previous societies. And he claims that um, given a certain degree of social complexity in these uh, ancient societies, mm -hmm. this coincided with the arrival of moralizing, punishing gods. So instead of having all these spirits with which you could you know, negotiate, did, uh, ritual here, you said a prayer there, etc. all of a sudden you had one punishing God. And this punishing God was above everyone else, the rise of monotheistic religions in the end. And uh, then with secularization, we have also secularized, you know, the punishing God, uh, the one God, we are speaking about uh, Kantian imperative and we have moral principles. And this is part of the modern world in which we live. We have a kind of normative order, which is part of this transcendental order. Um, <clears throat> and this is my speculative question. 
with which I will I will end very very quickly. Um, <clears throat> I uh, am asking myself, um, you know, I I see a weakening of this normative grip. We have spoken before about the collapse of the global order. You know, it's a weakening of the normative grip. We are unable with all the technology we have, with all the education we have, you know, to come to a common understanding for humankind. We need planetary action in climate change, in <clears throat> whatever we want to protect, yet we are unable to do that. We see <clears throat> a loss uh, or erosion <clears throat> Um, of this normative grip in terms of, you know, the many crises and how to deal with them. The pandemic has shown us governments are not in control. Uh, inflation, they are not in control. We have an environmental abyss. We have many angry people in Western societies, at least, that are upset with what is happening now and why governments and institutions cannot uh, respond uh, to them. We see the geopolitical tensions that nobody seems to be able to, to contain and, you know, <clears throat> manage to uh, a pre-tension uh, uh, level. And <clears throat> we also have to <clears throat> acknowledge we have underestimated the role of the imagination. <clears throat> we have lost the ability to imagine possible alternative futures. First of all, we don't have the time. We have no time to think about the future. But secondly, the future also has lost its shiny value. If you go back only 20, 25 years ago, you know, people still had some idea, <clears throat> be it flying cars or, or, or whatever. You know, th there was some kind of science fiction attached to visions of the future. This is gone. Who wants to think these days, apart from apocalyptic scenarios, what will happen in the future? We have no positive view of the future. And in this sense, we have lost <clears throat> uh, the future as, as, as we know it. And <clears throat> so <clears throat> we have instead, <clears throat> and this is our, uh, our biggest uh, challenge, I would say, we have the concentration of an enormous amount of economic power that is easily translatable into political power, as we know, in the hands of a few. And very often these few are the overconfident ones who believe they have unlimitable power. And that's our real dilemma. So what remains? My hope is still science. And science for a very simple reason. Science um, has shown us that the future is open. And this is a relatively recent discovery for a large part of humanity, because our ancestors, regardless of where they were around this globe, we're convinced destiny has been somehow, you know, written, determined by whoever. And it was only a few hundred years ago with the advent of science that the future became an open horizon. The future remains uncertain and uncertainty is the price we pay for openness. But I would urge us to embrace this uncertainty and to continue to work towards an open future. Thank you. So well, thank you very much. Looking at this in a more directly human way and at the same time yeah. in a very scientific way. But who wants to have questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Thanks very for, much for this very uh, interesting uh, presentation. I fully agree with what you said that uh, we don't understand what you made. We made when when physicists built the first transistor, I think they knew what they what they made and how it worked. When they built the first computer, I think they understand what the computer works. But at the point where you connect computers and make a network, it's becoming more complex and you don't understand them. That's a technological part.
about that. The other thing is how do humans, sub, uh, people use technology? And I think one of the problems and the fact that we don't understand anymore that the goal system that we have developed has a technical component and a human component. And that I think emphasizes the role of the humanities and social sciences uh, in understanding our the society that they have built. And basically I would say this from a science in, in science has a large impact on should have a large impact on science because the old-fashioned dichotomy between the hard science and humanities is gone. We need a merge of the two. What's your view on that? This is water on my mills, as we say. <laughs> no, I, I, I fully agree. I mean, a purely technical um, vision of the world will not get us yeah. anywhere. It will only aggravate the problems we have. We have to include the social sciences and the humanities. And uh, you are right, you know, I think this is one of the most unfortunate dichotomy. We have many dichotomies, yes. and most of them are unfortunate. But this dichotomy in particular, you know, is so uh, harmful to think, you know, there are the hard sciences yes. and, you know, the soft sciences. By the way, in the 19th century, you know, the Humboldt University in Germany, etc., was the reverse. In the social hierarchy, the humanities were highest. The technical disciplines were the lowest. Yeah. They came from the crafts and so on, and it was only uh, <clears throat> later on that you know they they were actually. And after all, these are social hierarchies, yeah? and we can do away with social hierarchies. And uh, when we are challenged, we need we need both perspectives. We need to cooperate. We need to find new synergy. <laughs> But you change our universities accordingly and so on. It's a long, uh, long stretch, and we need more imagination how to do it in different ways. Hmm. Thank you very much for uh, your fantastic talk, Phil. Uh, I'm very impressed. Um, it's very interesting what you say about um, that we better look at agency than at intelligence. And um, so if you look at the ancient world, um, apparently we didn't have so much agency. It's only um, in a world, in an open society, where we have a normative framework um, that we develop this idea of agency, thinking of Kant, for instance. And you said, we are losing now this normative framework. And I'm wondering, um, now we, we need to find a new paradigm for, uh, because it, it, it seems that it presupposes each other, that we, we need a normative framework in order to conceive ourselves as agents. Um, so I was wondering how you would envision um, a, a potential normative framework for, <clears throat> for envisioning um, a, an open and hopeful future for us, for, for, for the world, for ev ev everything, including the, the cosmic order. <laughs> uh, if we are really moving towards a new cosmic, cosmos means, you know, everything uh, yeah. around us. And do away with, um, you know, the, the separation between immanent and transcendental yeah. Yeah. is, of course, to separate the spheres. Yeah. yeah. Immanent world, everything is there. And with the transcendental, you have an upper part, you know, a higher part, and you have a lower part where humans are. And um, <clears throat> the, the upper part uh, has control over the lower part. Now, we have... Um, taken more of the upper part into the lower part, but we also see the limitations of what we can do with it. And to come up with new, um, call them, call it principles, normative, ethical principles, whatever you call it, we have to invent them. Yeah. And we have to invent them as we go along. You know, it's nothing, there's no shelf where you can, you know, pull it down and say, that's it, we cannot forage neither from an ancient culture nor from a present culture. We have to invent it. And we have to invent it by taking into account 
that uh, on the one hand, we still want to understand what we make, but as you, the, the previous uh, <clears throat> discussant rightly said, you know, we no longer can understand everything. So what, what do we do with this? Now with technology, we don't have to understand all the details. It's very easy. The, the moment you have, um, you know, a slight roll, you no longer have to understand the arithmetic below. The moment you have a light switch, you don't have to understand how electricity works, etc. But nevertheless, you have to keep un public understanding and understanding at another level. You know how are things interrelated? You have to to cultivate a processual thinking, a network thinking, complexity thinking. Uh, systems thinking, whatever you call it, you know, that things are connected and then people will learn how to fit in the various things. There's no blueprint for it. <clears throat> it's up to us, this generation here, the young generation, you have to invent it. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, sorry for asking a question again. I, I, I would like to um, share a little bit about my wife. Um, she is from Eritrea. Yeah, She's from Eritrea. Yeah. She did her first PhD on the Humboldt University, her second one here in Sweden, and she became the director of uh, the International Foundation for Science, uh, also here in Sweden. Talk about that in a moment mm -hmm. about illim Ill illimitable power. But first, about her her history. Her mother couldn't read or write. She has two PhDs. That's where potential is and where potential is being excluded. Again, I come to the same point. There is a huge capacity that's not having access to our kind of conversations, to uh, scientific literature. So that is, that, that, is, that is, yes, the role of science to keep us out, but make sure that you have science that has access and that is able to function. And I think that's a global public good to have at national levels, those kind of capacities. A global public good means that you have a financing model for supporting science in all the countries, at least, because that, that capacity is needed mm -hmm. to, to keep people honest and to have a sort of a track two kind of discussion also going on if the first power level is not is not uh, is not able to to function. So you have this second level, the, the great the great thing that we are having here, which should be convened everywhere. But for that, you need to also support that kind of structures. International Foundation for Science. It was created fifty years ago uh, together with with this institution. Um, it celebrated this year fifty years. It's being closed down. Funding from CEDA is stopped. Mm -hmm. In spite of analysis that shows that what they're doing is fantastic, it's based on networking, it's stopped. Because of, I would say, unlimited power in the hands of people that have private interests, smaller interests in funding agencies. I'm not only think of CEDA, but in this case, they were the culprit. So I, I appreciate what you're saying here. The element of power, is a very important one. So uh, there's a lot of associations. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I also once participated in a meeting of the International Foundation of Science here in, in, in Stockholm. And, uh, it was a very interesting meeting. We, we They're closing it. down. It's they have to close mm -hmm. down because of the policy of the funders. They're not stop stopping as an agency, but they have to stop their secretariat here. And they can no longer support and this, this is supporting young scientists in developing countries. Uh, it's one of the biggest institutes, if you like, because they have 500 people still working at the moment. But it's being closed down. No, I mean, I, I see this with this, um, you know, the, the, the rising geopolitical tensions. There's a very strong impact on um, international exchange, international relations, the kind of openness that this, it's, it's the lifeblood of science, you know, you need open exchange and you want to reach people that otherwise would not have access to the kind of knowledge uh, that, that we have. 
And <clears throat> what we are now seeing is just, uh, you know, more and more restrictions and also international organizations are looking very carefully. Where can we put our money? Can we spend on this or can we not spend on that? So, you know, we are <clears throat> constricting. On the other hand, um, there are many angry people and um, history shows us that sometimes the powerful give only in when they feel that the many angry people will overthrow them. This is also one <clears throat> of the lessons of history. It does not mean the angry people overthrow them. But uh, if you look, I know only European history. You know, but you can say, you know, whenever the elites of the day made concessions. They did not make concessions because they wanted to make concessions. And many revolutions started were, at universities, yeah? I mean, that is also... Because they were enlightened, but because <laughs> they felt it's better to make a concession now rather than being, um, you know, pressed to the wall tomorrow. So <clears throat> we don't preach revolution today, but, you know, there are other ways. We have to speak up. And where to speak up if not in rooms like this, which is, you know, I'm a foreign member of the Swedish Academy, by the way. Yes, sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, first, thanks for a lovely talk, by the way. Um, I, I think what you're seeing, yeah, just as a comment, is I'm in the governing board of CEDA, uh, it is actually the, the, it's a government decision. So, so I'm guessing it's an effect of, of governments contracting their support for, for science because of turbulence. I think it follows from what Natasha <laughs> Brooks said yesterday, that when you're in a phase of crises and turbulence, that's not when, when societies tend to promote and be innovative. So I think that it's, that's the effects that we've seen. What my question uh, to you, Helga, if I may, has to do with regulation of, of these tools and artificial intelligence. I, I sense a narrative uh, at least in some of these uh, companies and, and, and sector that you cannot regulate AI or that AI, if you do it, you will stifle innovation. And my background is political science. And I would say, yes, of course you can. I mean, it depends on if you want to regulate it or not, the ways that you can do it, right? I mean, we managed to, uh, I mean, we managed to regulate uh, electricity as <laughs> you used it as another example of, of general purpose uh, technology. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of data, yeah, but I mean, we, we manage to regulate and manage uh, financial data all the time. And those volumes are massive. Why wouldn't we be able to regulate AI technologies and their applications? If you, if you want to uh, set up a company to produce posters or breakfast posts, you can't just do it. I mean, you, there needs to be a standard. There's some certain standards that you need to follow. Why wouldn't we be able to do it for AI? So I would... Curious to hear your thought of AI regulation. Where is it going? Is it possible? And what are the limitations of control of AI? Well, as you undoubtedly know, Europe is trying. And right now we have the AI Act still in deliberation with massive, massive lobbying. And if you follow it only from the outside, I don't follow it in detail, you know. You hear when we were supposed to finish the draft, we incorporated the last compromises yesterday, but today, you know, there's another, <clears throat> another compromise we have to make due to massive, massive lobby. Nevertheless, the AI Act is the best we can hope for right now in the sense that the EU takes a risk-oriented approach, risk-based approach, to say you cannot regulate a specific uh, technology, but you have to say certain applications will be in the red zone or in the orange zone or in the green zone. And therefore, then we have to look closer, et cetera, because it's a rolling uh, process. And uh, we know this from every innovation. The law always lags behind. It's like uh, the turtle and Achilles. Yes. You cannot overtake it. But maybe we have to invent a new way of lawmaking also. You know, now we have, you know, we make a law <clears throat> and it captures what needs to be done today. 
And then, if necessary, we make an amendment in a couple of years or so, and you know, we see what has happened. Maybe we need a new process of lawmaking that is more open and rolling, that you can, you know, you follow the technology and say, wait a moment, you know, this is not right. We have to put a stop there, or we have to do something there. Historically, uh, Carlotta Perez, an economic historian, has done a very nice work on um, how at the <clears throat> turn of uh, the 19th to the 20th century in the US, <clears throat> there was um, you know, this wave of industrialization and this enormous concentration uh, in the hands of Rockefellers and <clears throat> And the only way to do anything against this concentration of power was regulation, but it takes the political will and you have to do it. And she says, without that, we see the same phenomenon. It's an enormous socioeconomic paradigm change. You know, the technology is so forceful, it enters every nick, uh, every um, you know <clears throat> spot in the in the economy. There's no way of escaping it. It trickles down, touches everything. So unless you do it, you have winner takes all. You have this enormous concentration of power in the hands of very few who believe they have illimitable power. It's an illusion, but this is what they believe. And the government has to say no. So in the EU, we try. It's far from perfect. We don't know what will be written in the AI Act in the very last, because it has to go, now it's in the parliament, has to go back to the governments, the, the, the council and the and, and the commission, and then <clears throat> it still has to be implemented because the nicest law does not help you if it's not implemented. The problem is um, Europe is not alone and Europe is not in the most powerful position to regulate either. You may have heard that no one in Europe can use BART, the latest generative AI by, issued by Google. You can <clears throat> use it. Uh, I think Norway has some uninhabited islands somewhere <laughs> with 500 people. <laughs> you can use it there. Um, probably somebody forgot this, but you know. <laughs> but in Europe, you cannot use it, and it's believed this is a signal that Google sends mm -hmm. to Europeans. If you want to use it, maybe you're a bit nicer to us. So. Europe is not in the <clears throat> best position <clears throat> to do. Nevertheless, you know, we <clears throat> European citizens expect uh, <clears throat> uh, the EU to, to, to regulate it. But when it comes to the US, there are some attempts uh, across the Atlantic, you know, start some regulation. Some of the American um, states are starting regulation. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of patchwork. And then China has its own regulation, including an alignment with the values of the Communist Chinese parties. If we speak about alignment of values, the Chinese have already done it, at least on by, by command. So, so this is the world in which we live. And then there's the rest of the world who will somehow have to fit themselves into this um, you know, power constellation that we spoke about here. But it can be regulated, but it has to be regulated. Yes. Mm -hmm. I am no scientist, so I may be completely out of line with my comment. No, no. <laughs> uh, I am. Uh, there are some, sometimes when I, I hear somebody speak, that there are some things in their speech that emerge with very bright light and make me make new connections. This has happened today. You still need to meditate very much between the connections between four things you have said, as I have understood them. One is the externalization of agency to technology, mm -hmm. connected with another thing you said, the identity crisis, mostly of youth today and of groups. The third one is the loss of capacity to imagine a better future. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one is the power of those who live in the illusion of control, of total control. The power of? The, the, the power of those that live 
in the illusion of total control. The power of laws. Those, 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 Thank you. Um, yeah, I, it's, it took some time to think about your presentation because it's so rich in so many perspectives and uh, to pose my question, actually. And I think it's very important to also consider that it's in history, it's um, often written about that it's difficult to tackle a beast if you consider it an enormous beast with so much power and so much power and nobody knows what to do and, and things like that. So maybe it's interesting to actually, um, besides this part of regulation and on the law side, to think about the social construction of what we deal with. Um, because if you want to go back to being able to act and think about the agency that we uh, give this kind of technology or that we um, yeah, attach to it somehow, it's actually comparable to these um, examples that you mentioned before. I mean, if you look at the tree and wait for a blossom or something to give you a sign to do something special, it's some kind of natural randomness that you've got there. And uh, so you had some kind of agency input for which you wait to that tree at that moment. And so this kind of randomness is sort of generated by an artificial intelligence algorithm whether you need to call it intelligent or not, you know. Um, yeah, but still it's it, this kind of um, input that people seem to wait for. So while during that social construction, that situation, people attach agency to that technology in that way. So um, they hand over the leading position to that technology in that very way. way. And if it's a, in an organization, it, it may cause more harm um, if decision makers rely on it, then if it's just, uh, well, do I need to use this soap or that shower device, you know, it's just uh, depending on what kind of choice you make. Um, but I think maybe we, it's actually an easier way to tackle the social construction within society. Then you don't have to ask the big um, companies for it. So what do you say to that? When, you know, I, I think social construction goes only so far <clears throat> because it assumes um, that you have a lot of knowledge already, that you are able to unpack and deconstruct and without falling back into some kind of legalism <laughs> in, in the end, where you say, well, everything is only social construction, which I believe is not true. And uh, to to come back to the you know to randomness, I, I wrote a book also called The Cunning of Uncertainty. And I think um, there is a place of randomness in our life. And uh, one way of coping with uncertainty mm -hmm. is to realize that sometimes in life, if you have a very difficult decision to make, and you <clears throat> really consider very carefully the pros and the cons as far as you can. And you don't reach a clear decision. Should I do this or should I do that? And then you say, well, you know, let's leave it up to chance. You transfer your agency to randomness. Mm -hmm. In the end, <clears throat> you are most likely more satisfied because you said, I tried everything to make this decision difficult as it is, I could not make a decision, I could not. And now it has been decided for me and I live with it. And you're more satisfied with my thesis than if you would have taken one or the other, because if you start to regret it, then you say, okay, I should have done this and, and so on. So there are instances of this kind where I would say randomness at its but it means, of course, you have to reflect about it. It's all about having more reflection in our daily life. But how can we ask people to reflect more if their life is filled with all this information and entertainment and stress? <clears throat> you know, it's a mixture of 
um, overload, information overload emotionally, including stress. Yes, some of it is fun, but some of it is stressful. And this is something that we also have to realize needs to be kept at the but you know what what you call social I would say you know we need more time for reflection and we have to cultivate people should start to think we want to think about it we want to reflect about it then maybe we find a better way of dealing it should be really handed off you know, sometimes you hand over your agency of course mm -hmm. you sit in a plane you hand over your agency you don't even think about it unless you have uh, you know fear of flying but normally you don't think about it yeah? but if you go into a, <clears throat> a scanning machine it's a bit more scary because you think well after all doctors also make mistakes you know <clears throat> and uh, what is the reputation of this hospital and and so on you know people think about it let's encourage them to think more about it okay i'll go very briefly yes you know, uh, Helga, thank you very much. You have really crystallized the fundamental, the core problem. Because you say that this weakening of the normative grip, you need a, a norm in order to have the law, which then creates the regulation. Okay? So I give you a classic example of this problem. If you have an artificial intelligence program to manipulate the markets, who is guilty? And the answer is we don't know. <clears throat> You know, is it the programmer? Is it the company that does it? Is it the agent who is helping them to manipulate the market? And since it is a market manipulation, the costs are not borne by individuals, it's borne by the whole market. It's going borne by the whole system. So you don't have a, a you, you don't have a identified victim and you cannot identify who is the guilty one. And then you cannot identify the degree of the intent, which is the agency issue. Classic law has always been said exactly we can determine who is guilty and who is not guilty. In the artificial intelligence, we don't know. We don't even know the norm. But we have to link agency with accountability and responsibility. If we transfer agency to the machine, and then this is where regulation has to set in. And of course, um, you know, beyond the regulation we are now fighting over words and this compromise and that compromise and in uh you know two years time we will have an amendment and and so on but we need <clears throat> we need a normative principle <clears throat> somewhere <clears throat> in all of this to say we want to hold the ai accountable and who is it in the ai and once we give this up, we are lost. We are lost to markets. We are lost to the people with the inimitable power. Exactly. So let's think about that over the last <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. time. We have five minutes over. We meet again at two, right? Yeah.